comes up in your life. Thank you, Karen. Good evening. It's good to see you all here tonight. If you're joining us online, we're glad to have you with us as well for Monday night of our revival services. And we're going to ask we all stand as we sing our call to worship tonight as we come into his house. We have come into his house and holy ground. So it's good to see you all tonight. Uh, glad you're back tonight. Uh, coming up soon, uh, it'll be here before you know it, December 28th through 30th is our Extreme Winter Youth Conference, Youth Trip. Uh, probably don't have a lot of youth here tonight, but uh, we always have a good time. I got my biggest youth right here. She's here. I know she has a good time. She has to go show, how, show those uh, kids how to have a good time. But... Uh, Cindy, you gonna, she's, she's going to be with me again, right? All right. But thank you all, uh, everybody who's sponsoring so far. And then uh, Operation Christmas Child is underway. If you haven't noticed the shoe boxes out there in the foyer, uh, they're out there. And uh, it's time to grab one and think about stuffing it and sending it off. Um, you, can, you can now, we've done this last year, might have been year before, I can't remember now, 
but we we did it online. We did the the postage and all online, printed it off, and we were able to uh, track it. And I can't remember where it went now. <laughs> it went to Central America somewhere. I know that, but I can't remember the country now. But anyway, you're able to follow it around. That's pretty neat. I have to. Add, Anna will know. She'll remember. She's my rememberer. But if you don't want to do the shopping, uh, Susie Van Dyke will do the shopping for you. It's just for 20 bucks, she can stuff the box and, and send it off. All right, September the 19th, uh, Sam Warner from the Georgia Baptist Foundation and New Work Foundation is coming to talk to us about faithfully stewarding our estates. And so uh, we, can, we can still have a kingdom impact after we're gone uh, if, we set, if we set it up right now. And so uh, that'll be September the 19th at 2 p.m. So uh, y'all be here for that. And then Angel Wings uh, Ministry is uh, Encouragement Ministry of Pleasant Grove. Uh, they're looking for volunteers. And so contact Miss Shirley Olmstead if you're interested in that. Now, I know one thing they do is write cards. Uh, that's the primary thing they do? Okay. Uh, that's an important thing. I don't like doing that, so I'm glad they do it. All right, uh, Sisterhood Luncheon coming up Wednesday, the 25th, 1130 at Mucho Caliente. Uh, ladies, join for, fellow, for fun and fellowship. And then men, um, our Brotherhood Breakfast is Saturday, August 28th at 830 at the Pavilion. We also have our Thursday men's prayer lunch, 1130 at Shane's each week. So, but good to be with you all tonight. Looking forward to uh, hearing another message from, is it Dr. Frank Cox? Dr. Cox. All right. Good evening. Glad to see you here tonight, and I know many of you are joining us online tonight, so we're glad that you're a part of our revival this week. Uh, so glad to have Dr. Cox here with us, and uh, he can certainly clean up the mess that was made yesterday, so that's why we put him in this spot. You know, you always put your best hitter in the third spot in the batting order, so uh, <laughs> tell, 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 tell. You can use that one with, with them. So anyway, but I am so glad he and Mary are here tonight. His wife is with him, and we just welcome them to Pleasant Grove Baptist Church this evening. We want to ask God to be a part of what goes on here tonight. We want him to ask, ask him to work in our hearts. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, thank you for the blessing of being able to gather and to have these revival services, Lord. We want to lift those to you in this church and in this community who are dealing with COVID right now. We know there are some in this community in particular who are in very dire situations, and we pray for those, Lord, that we know in this church who are facing uh, difficult situations with COVID, one in particular, God, that uh, uh, two in particular that are struggling. Lord, that I just ask you to be close to them and minister to their needs right now. God, help us to focus our attention upon you as we sing your praise. May we indeed uh, be drawn into your presence. And then, Lord, as we hear from your word, we, we lift Dr. Cox to you and ask you to speak through him powerfully that our hearts would be sensitive to your leadership and would be open to receive what you want us to apply in our lives. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen.
Lord's love is endless, and it is uh, amazing. And uh, we're going to be singing about the goodness of God right now. The, his love, His goodness, His mercy is ours, and it has no end. So uh, I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing together. The goodness of God.
Thank you for that good singing. You may be seated. Amen. We're going to continue singing. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. And we're going to join that with Amazing Grace. How sweet to sing. Let's sing again. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. Let's do His good will. He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and First thing that I want to encourage you in, we do have our offering plates out, as you know. With COVID, we haven't been passing the plates, and usually during revival, we do collect an offering for revival, so I just want to encourage you, as you have opportunity tonight, tomorrow night, or the next night, if you want to help support what we're doing with revival, and appreciate uh, the men who have come in to share with us, if you just place an offering in those offering plates on your way out or on your way in tomorrow night, whatever the case may be, but thank you for helping support. You give so generously throughout the year. It's such a blessing uh, to be a part of this church. 
As I mentioned earlier, we have Dr. Frank Cox and his wife Mary with us tonight. Uh, Frank has been at North Metro for 41 years. I leaned over and asked him how long. I, was, I knew it was over 30. I did not remember it was 41. I asked him if he started when he was 10. Uh, but uh, um, I, and then I got to thinking back, Frank, when you started at North Metro, I was 13. So, <laughs> and, and I say this with all sincerity. As long as, I, as long as I can think back in Georgia Baptist life as a minister, I, I've known who you were. Now, I, I didn't get to know Frank until, really until we served together on the trustees at Truett. Uh, but I appreciate him so much being willing to come over and share with us tonight. And, and indeed, um, I love hearing Frank preach every time I get to hear him preach. So thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I reached in the Wayback Machine tonight. Okay, Kim's nodding her head because she knows exactly what I'm talking about. I have one of those little things. Some of you probably remember these. They're called a cassette. <laughs> I have a cassette. My soundtrack tonight is a cassette. But this song is almost 40 years old, uh, but when I was a, when I was a teenager, um, it was, it was a, one of my favorites back in the day, and um, it, just, it just says a lot that we need to be reminded of often, that no matter what we go through, no matter where we are, he is always right there with us. It's all but over You say there's no use in trying You say he'll never ever hear you crying But when the tears start falling He knows the reason long before you turn and find He's been with you all the time, and he is right where you are, right when you need to know that someone cares, right where you are, saying I love you so, and no things you've done knowing how far you've run you wonder just how someone could ever find you no matter where you're going no matter where you've been or where your heart has strayed he has followed all the way, and he is right where you are, right when you need to know that someone cares, right where you are, saying I love you so, and no someone cares right where you are saying I love you so and always will be right where you are right when you need to know that someone cares right where you are saying I love you so and always
Test him. There you go. Hey, Con, uh, tell your wife, is she here tonight? Is she watching? He's not answering. She played a joke on uh, Dr. Canner last time he was here. I put her up to it. And uh, Dr. Canner had this girlfriend up in Ohio. True story. And uh, at least his brother tells me it's true. And uh, so anyway, he was kissing on his girlfriend one night when they came home from a date. And he was, he was so much into that kiss that uh, he took his foot off the, the brake and ran the car through the garage. And so it, how long ago has it been since we were all here? About five years ago, something like that? Four years ago. So I was, I was joking with Con back there. I said, what woman would marry a man by the name of Con? And so Sue introduced herself to me. So she's from Ohio, and that's where Canner's from. And so I, I said to her, I said, uh, now tomorrow night I need for you to go up to Dr. Canner, and here's what I need for you to do. Keep a straight face and say to him, said, uh, are, are you from Ohio? And he's going to say yes and say, well, said, I have a niece in Ohio that used to date a Muslim that got saved and became a Baptist, and now he's a president of a Baptist college here in Georgia. Are you that man? And then he's going to look at you and say, well, it all depends. And say, well, she said one night y'all were kissing, and you ran through the garage with a car. And she did it. And he still talks about that to this day, <laughs> how she would know that. Hey, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, your pastor, Dan. Uh, I want you to know that that he's old enough now uh, that, uh, that you become known as somebody else, all right? Uh, I'm Mary's husband. I'm Stephen's father, Jonathan's father, Kristen's father. And, and the one I love is I'm my grandchildren's pop, all right? And, uh, and so Dan is old enough now that no longer is he Dan uh, Rosser, but he's also, uh, he's Brooks' dad, okay? who is a great pitcher at, at Truett McConnell University, and uh, he's got a 94-per-hour fastball. And so that means you get out of the way when it comes towards you, right? And uh, I know y'all are proud of Brooks as well. Well, let me tell you about one of my sons. One of my sons, I want you to start looking for Acts chapter 12. One of my sons, his name is Jonathan. And Jonathan is a neat guy. And uh, Jonathan is a, a special force operator. And uh, he's an Army Ranger. He's a Green Beret. I mean, you know, his last job was he was a Jedburg in the, in the Special Forces, which means that, that he had a team of three, him and two other guys. Now, if you from the Army or the military, you know the smaller the team, the more highly specialized you become. A Jedburg is one that goes in, they drop into a country behind uh, enemy lines, and you uh, join up with the resistant forces, and you overthrow governments. That's what my boy does. And so, but when he was in Afghanistan, he's been over there twice, uh, in Afghanistan, he, uh, he, uh, he had the number one special force team. He had 12 guys and a dog. And so one night we were, we were FaceTiming. War is different now. And uh, we were FaceTiming with him. And so Jonathan was in their, their gym part, uh, their base, their outward basin, and uh, their forward basin, and they were working out. And the dog was on the treadmill right behind. So Mary, his mom, saw the dog walking on the treadmill. She got so concerned about that dog. She asked my son this. She says, do y'all put little shoes on that dog, you know? And which they do at different times, depending upon the uh, terrain. And so, you know, but we're proud of him. He, uh, he's got a bronze star for valor. Uh, they were ambushed one night. And uh, the, the guy on this side, uh, his, his scope on his machine gun was shot off. And his Sarge on this side under John's command was shot square in the face and killed. And so he drew fire to himself while his team maneuvered and carried the old Sarge back out of the battlefront. He's also got a, 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 uh, a, uh, a purple heart uh, because of two years ago in a, in a very intense battle that they went in and took a compound. His team of 12 with, took on thir, uh, 300 Taliban. 
to open up, uh, to capture this compound where all their explosives were. And as they were, they were laying out the explosives after they took care of the 300 Taliban, uh, they were laying out explosives, and his intelligence sergeant said, John, get the team further back. So John had to turn around and walk away, and when he did, he heard a gun go off, and all those explosives began to explode and uh, killed his intelligence sergeant who took most of the blast, and Jonathan uh, was, was injured from that. Uh, very impressed with what he does. The day I knew, Dan, that I would no longer mess with him was when he graduated from Ranger School, and they showed us everything he knew how to do. And then they showed us how he could sever your head from your body in 15 seconds. At that point, I said, I would never mess with him ever again. And so he's a dude. I mean, he is a real dude. Uh, but but I, I, I have a, a heightened in, uh, a love for military. How many of you guys in the room, or ladies, served in the military? Let me see your hands, all right? How many of you guys were in Vietnam? Let me see your hands. Thank you for your service. Most overlooked group ever that's gone to battle and came back home. They came back home in a rough time. Well, there was this one Vietnam vet that, that was in the fierce of battle. And he was, as he was in the fierce of battle, he uh, they, they was in a firefight, and he reached down to his side, took a hand grenade, pulled the pin, and went to chunk it toward the, the Viet Cong. By the time it left his hand, it malfunctioned and exploded. And it, it pretty well just singed his body it totally disfigured him, and it also, it blew off both his ears. And so, you know, but he could still function. He could still hear, and, and he recuperated, and he stayed in the Army. And so after about 25 years of service, they finally decided that they would give him his own command, that he could command this particular base. And so they sat there, and they said to him, they said, I'll tell you what, said, uh, you can hire three guys to help you run this base. And so though Vietnam vet that had no ears, he, he began to interview. He brought in this young helicopter pilot and uh, who was a captain. And so they began the interview process. And he noticed that captain kept looking at him kind of strangely. Uh, it was like a, he, he was looking at him like something was wrong. And so at the end of that interview, that, that old Vietnam vet looked back at that young captain and said this. said, I know you've been looking at me. Do you see anything strange about me? And so that, that young captain looked at him and said, Yes, sir. Said, You don't have any ears. And it made, it made that Vietnam veteran mad. Threw him out, didn't hire him. So he brought in a young lieutenant and they came in and they started the interview process and, and he noticed he was looking at him strangely. And so they got to the end of the interview. He looked at him and said, do you see anything different about me? And the lieutenant said, yes, sir, you don't have any ears. And so it made him mad and threw him out and didn't hire him. Then he brought in an old Sarge, an enlisted man, a man who came up through the ranks, crisp in, uh, in his uniform, sat across from that Vietnam vet, and they, they went through the interview, and he noticed that old Sarge just sat there very stoic and looked at him. And so he got to the end of that interview, and he thought he ought to ask the same question. So he looked at him and said this. He said, I noticed you've been looking at me. Do you see anything strange about me? And that old Sarge says, well, yes, sir. He said, I noticed you wear contact lenses. And he said, and he said, you know I wear contact lenses? And the old sergeant said, yes, sir. Anybody knows if you have, don't have no ears, you can't wear no glasses. <laughs> Sometimes when you state the obvious, you get in trouble. Well, let me tell you what I want to do tonight. I want to preach on the obvious, and that is the songs that we've sung has reminded us that God is right here with us. No matter where we are in life, our mighty God is still alive, and our mighty God is still here. I, I want you to look at, 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 at uh, the book of Acts in chapter 12, and I just want to read this four verses of Scripture, even though I'm going to cover a whole lot more than that. And I want to preach on the subject of the God of Simon Peter still lives. And you see today, the obvious, I'm going to state the obvious. And as I state the obvious, I may upset one or two, and that's okay. Because you see, every now and then you need to get shaken. 
Every now and then you need to, to get a proverbial two by four. Every now and then you've got to understand that what we say we believe, we must believe. And we must live it out in our everyday lives. In Acts chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass or persecute some from the church. And then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Simon Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. And so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and he delivered to, uh, to him to four guards, squads of soldiers, to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Now, I want to tell you something I've been studying in my church's life. You know, this pandemic, our church is being hit by this pandemic just like your church has. And churches all around the world. And so, you know, you go from a church running about 12, 1,300, and all of a sudden you're down to just me and three camera guys in an auditorium for about three months. And then we thought, well, as soon as we open the doors back up, they're all going to flood back in, and, man, church is going to get back to normal. And so we opened the doors at the end of May. And do you know what? All of a sudden my church had changed. All of a sudden, there are people that, that I still, 18 months later, have not seen. I, they say they're watching me on, on TV. And, and I even have them say to me things like this now. They'll say, Pastor, say, man, said we love getting up and cooking breakfast and getting our coffee and sitting there and watching you live every single Sunday morning. And I sat there and I'm thinking to myself, where is your faith? And whatever I did, I learned I preached one sermon on faith and not fear. And I preached you can't have fear and faith living in the same house. And boy, you talking about people getting upset? Boy, do they get upset. Because if you preach not to have fear, they say if you say you got fear, you don't have faith. They were all upset about that. And so we, we've sat there and we've watched our church come back and, and it's kind of like a roller coaster ride right now. You know, one Sunday you're way up, next Sunday you're way down. And I don't know about your church, your church is probably doing a whole lot better than a lot of churches in the metropolitan area of Atlanta. But I started something. I started just preaching through the book of Acts. I started going in Acts chapter 1 where God says that we're all going to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. What better time than in a moment of crisis to be that witness for Jesus Christ. And then in Acts chapter 2, where the Spirit of God came down. Remember, he said you're going to be a witness when the Spirit of God comes upon your life. And every single one of us in this room has the Spirit of God. If you're saved, you have the Spirit of God living in your life. So the question becomes, how's your witness? How are you doing in sharing your faith? And so I, I preached on Acts chapter 2 where the Spirit of God comes down and, and that form of the fire, the tongues of fire, and about how 3,000 souls got saved. Then we kept on marching through the book of Acts and we kept reading about, about the different things. I, I love the one where, where Peter and John got arrested and we saw the power of prayer that we, we're going to talk about in a moment. And, and then I, I loved it when they got there and you remember there was a man by the name of Barnabas who was just a son of encouragement. And uh, he went and sold some land, and he brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet so that everybody's needs would be met. Y'all remember these stories? And so, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about, man, I would like to be like Barnabas in my own life. Well, there was somebody else who thought the same thing. And that was an old man by the name of Ananias and Sapphire's wife. You remember that? And so Ananias and her, they, they kind of uh, uh, came together and conspired together. So I tell you what let's do. Let's go, let's go sell some of our property and, and we'll bring some of the proceeds and we'll lay it at the apostles' feet because you see, Ananias liked seeing what, what everybody was saying about Barnabas. And so they, they went and sold, but see, there was a problem. They were only going to give a portion of it. And now he, he tells them, they, they ask him, and he lies to the Holy Spirit, and God took him out. You know what I thought about? Man, all that has to happen is one Sunday for us to have a similar experience at my church, and God just slay him in the spirit right there, dead at the altar. I tell you what, it would shape up our churches in a heartbeat, wouldn't it? 
And so then his wife had this spiritual gift, shop till you drop. And so she was down at the, the mall, and, uh, and she didn't know what happened to her husband. What Acts chapter? Y'all don't read the same Bible I do, do you? And so here she, she, she was down at the mall over there, and, and she was shopping, and she was spending some of that extra money they were keeping back for themselves. And see, you got to know how to read the Bible. And so, so here it was that she came back, and she did not, according to the Bible, she did not know that her husband was already carried to the cemetery. And so they, they quizzed her, and, and she was just like her husband. And so what she did was she lied to the Spirit of God. And then, boom, zap, there she was, gone, dead. And so uh, I like the way they warned her before she died. How would you like this, somebody warn you this way? Hey, the, the feet of the same men who carried your husband to the cemetery is standing outside the door about to carry you. Oh, that straightened me up. I know that. And so, you know, and so I, I, I preached to my church about that, about lying to the Spirit of God. And then I enjoyed reading about that, that great young follower of Christ by the name of Stephen who was stoned to death. And man, I tell you what, you see that it, the persecution began. And man, people began to spread all around their known world, but the apostles and all were teaching and preaching and thousands were coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. And then we come on down to chapter 11 and we see where, where God is expanding the kingdom of God. He is moving it from just being a, a gospel, it seemed like, for just the Jews. And now he's going to open it up to the Gentiles. And he was going to, to spread the gospel literally around the world. And every one of us sitting in this room or watching on those cameras tonight, we ought to be thankful for that because you see, if it hadn't been for that, we wouldn't be sitting here tonight worshiping our living God. And so here it was. We, we know about, about uh, Peter there and, and the and the vision and the sheet coming down with everything that, that was unclean. I don't know, rattlesnakes. I don't know, alligators. I don't, unclean. And, and God saying, get up and eat from it. Not me, God. I'm not going to eat from that. And God lays it out. Why are you calling something unholy that I say is clean? I can see many of us have that same attitude when we look at people around us that may not have grown up the way we did, don't live on the same side of the track as we do, and we sit and say, we're just willing to allow them to go to hell, and God says, why in the world are you that way? And man, I'm just getting all wrapped up in this thing, and man, I, I, I am so excited about what God's doing in my life and in my church's life to, out of the book of Acts. And, you know, and every one of us need to hear some straightforward stuff from time to time, you know, I, like, such as about being unclean. I, I'll never forget, I, I told this story to my church. Hey, you've been there 41 years, you've got some stories. And somebody says, why have you been there 41 years? My church didn't want much of a pastor, and I'm not much of one as far as they're concerned, and so it's a good marriage together, all right? And so here we are, several years ago, a man from L.J., a man from L.J., Pastor, he joined my church. And I can see him right now singing right up there, Mr. Music Man, right in the middle of the choir. And man, the choir law packed out, <clears throat> you know, about 120 people up there singing. And boy, right there in the middle, there he stands. And one day there was a, a sweet little girl that came and joined our church. Now, she was different. Her hair was stringy. Her hair was oily. She had a little boy in the nursery that had a biting problem. I know because he bit my daughter. She had a, a, a husband who you just knew didn't have much on the ball. And, and, and they were hungry. And my wife and I would carry food over to their house. And it was one of those that your grandparents would each talk to you about, but we don't see in this day and time. And that was that there was, you could go in their house and see the chickens under the floor because of the cracks in the floor. But she also had another problem. And the other problem was that, that she, uh, she had bad hygiene. I don't think she knew what a bar of soap was. I don't think she, 
She brushed her teeth very often. But she loved Jesus. And she joined the choir. And where my minister of music put her was right up there next to the men's section. Next to the guy that joined my church. Several weeks went by. And one day, Mr. Music Man, the, the man, called me up and said, can I come by and see you? I said, sure, come on. He came by and see me and said, Pastor, and they always speak in, in, in you know, fair saying tones. Our brother, Pastor. And I said, yeah, what can I do for you, man? He said, we've got a challenge. And I said, what kind of challenge we got? He said, you know this woman that joined the choir? I said, yes, sir. Stand, stands right up there next to you. Yes, sir. So the problem is that she has hygiene problems. I said, really? Like I never noticed, you know? I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, some of us in the choir has been talking and praying. Uh, listen, when they tell you they've been talking and praying, they've just been, they just been gossiping. They haven't been praying nothing. <laughs> and so I, I sat there and I listened to him, and, and I said, about what? He says, we have decided either she goes or we go. Can y'all tell I got a fiery personality? So I looked back at him, and I sat there, and I said, just a minute, let me make sure I understand this. Y'all wanted her out of the choir. Yes, sir. And, you know, and I sat there, and I looked at her on a lot of Sundays, and, you know, and where I was sitting, I could see her, and she's right there just singing for Jesus with a big smile on her face right next to the Pharisees. And so I sat there, and I looked back at him and said, just a moment, just a moment, let me pray just for a second or two. And so I bowed my hair, head for a second or two, and I looked back up at him, and I said, well, we do have a problem. And I said, I tell you what, I'm going to continue to ask God for him. He said, what's that, Pastor? He, and I said, y'all want me to ask her not to sing in the choir anymore. Right, Pastor? I said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to, in my prayer life, I'm going to ask God, as you people leave the choir, for God to give us more of her and less of y'all. Because, you see, I want to tell you something. They were saying she was unclean. And I'm telling you, God says, why do we call something unclean that he says is, is clean, is holy? And so, man, I'm reading this. I'm getting so pumped. I'm getting so excited. Man, I'm just having me a good time. I'm having a spell every Sunday in my pulpit. Now, I don't know where the church is, but I am. And then I came to chapter 12. Now, folks, I want to tell you what. Chapter 12 is a transitional chapter in the book of Acts. You see, the gospel is moving from just the Jews, and now it's going to the Gentiles. And so, man, it is a transitional chapter in the story of the gospel. You see, it used to be they would just think that some would want it to just be a, 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 a gospel for a, a, a sect of the Jews. That was Peter's problem. And now God would say, no, I'm getting ready to open up the gospel to all the world, even to the Gentiles. Those that you would never, the pagans, the unre, hey, those the unreligious, those that you would never think, Peter, I'm going to send the gospel to them. And so when I looked at this chapter, I began to see the mighty presence of Almighty God. Now, I want to tell you something. I've been a Baptist all my life. I want you to know I've been to church nine months before I was ever born. I want you to know the first Sunday out of my mother's womb, I was in the first Baptist church, Sop Choppy, Florida, if you can find that on a map where my dad passed her, and I went to the nursery, and I had a diaper bag, and I had a dollar bill in that diaper bag to give to the church that day. I have been a contributing Baptist all my life. And I'm going to tell you something. A lot of our Baptist churches do not know of the mighty presence of God. We've got, I, was, I was the other day. I hadn't got to my sermon yet. I hadn't got there, Dan. I'm sorry. I went to a church just down the road down the expressway from y'all. I'd tell you the name of it. And if you get me outside the door and just ask me, I may tell you the name of that church. Our church is getting ready to relocate a second time. Uh, we're 127 years of age, something like that. We started in 1893. You do the math. And so I've already relocated them once, and now I'm getting ready to relocate them a second time. I am a, I am an idiot. That's what I am. And so, and so we're looking at different church buildings. 
So we go to this church building. Everybody tells us, you got to go look at it. So we went over there, a group of five or six men, and we were sitting there, and they were telling us it's one of these up-to-date churches, you know what I mean? It's one of these that, that, that everybody knows that they're, they're the kicking stuff. And so we're standing there talking, and, and we look through all their, their complex, and one of my men said, what's the demographics of your membership? Here's what they said. They said, well, we have singles, we have doubles, and we have same-sex marriages. I'm writing something, and when they said same-sex marriages, I looked up. And I, I, I just, you know, I had to tell myself, don't, don't look so stunned, Frank, on your face. I'm going, you know, and the guy repeated it. He repeated it a second time for emphasis. And we sit there and think that we can compromise the word of God and we see the mighty hand of God. We're playing games in churches today. And so here's what's happened. God is bringing the church. He's expanding the kingdom of God. He is spreading the gospel to all that world. And all of a sudden, they're seeing the mighty hand of God. I want to talk to you about the, the, the fact that God still lives. You see, there's three things I want you to see very quickly tonight. And first of all, it's simply this, that persecution always brings fear. I, I'll never forget a few years ago, 2015, somewhere along there, it, it was during, before the presidential election. Donald Trump asked about 500 of us to come to New York City to sit down with him. And so I, I'm game, so I, I flew into New York City. And we go to this ballroom. And Trump comes into the ballroom, sits on a sofa, for six hours and talks to us and answers every question that we've got. Well, you're talking about some interesting questions 500 preachers have toward Trump. We asked them. And I told my church I didn't go to see if I would vote for him. I just went to see if I could vote for him. And so we're sitting there, and the first thing out of his mouth is this. You preachers don't realize you're being persecuted. And you don't realize that your religious liberties are at stake. And he began to cite instance after instance after instance in America where persecution was coming upon the saints of God. And he's right. We sit in our church on Sunday and sing about what a friend we have in Jesus. We'll sing in our church houses, amazing grace. We'll sing in our churches houses about go and tell the story. And yet we don't even realize that they're tolerating us. And they're taking away our religious li liberties one by one. Pandemic. Trying to force us into a mold. Vaccinated, unvaccinated. And we sit back there. They saw how quickly they could control us. And I'm sitting there looking at all this. But you know, the Bible speaks to this. Maybe not about a COVID-19, and I do think it's serious. But yeah, I want you to understand that it talks to us about persecution. And you see, in the Bible, in Acts chapter 12, it says there was a, a wicked king. And he was bringing about harassment to the saints of God in the New Testament church. And so here was the presence of the wicked king. The wicked king's name was Herod. And so Herod, I tell you what, he was after those who were on the front line for Jesus Christ. And it was a rejoicing time for them, but a scary time for them as well. And so in order for you to understand the persecution they was bringing, you've got to understand the persecutor. And so you go back and look at Herod. He comes from a dysfunctional family. Do y'all come from a dysfunctional family? Well, my wife and I was talking about our two families on the way up here tonight. And you know, I hate to admit it, Dan, but I got some weirdos in my family. <laughs> Anybody else got weirdos in your family? Best Christmas series I ever done in 41 years. 
In fact, I may brush it off again this year. It's been about 10 years ago since I preached it, and that is Cousin Eddie. And I tell my church all the time, if you can't, you can't pick out which one is Cousin Eddie in your household or in your family, you're it. I mean, listen, <laughs> Cousin Eddie, he, he's different. I've got some Cousin Eddies in my, in, my, in my family lineage there, I want you to know. But King Herod was also from a dysfunctional family. When you stop and look at King Herod, listen, his father had been murdered by his grandfather. You need to understand, you're talking about Herod the Great, you talk about wicked. Let, let's carry it a step further. He was the, his grandfather was the one who ordered all the babies killed after the birth of Jesus. They were all wicked. I've been to Israel 14 times going back this coming uh, December, and I'm going to tell you why. If you were to go with us, we'd carry and show you how paranoid he was. This guy was evil personified. After the death of his father, the Herod of Acts chapter 12 was sent to Rome to be educated and raised in an imperial family. And when you look at his life, murder and intrigue was in his psyche. And when he heard about these New Testament saints, he didn't want them around. And he set out to persecute him. You know who Herod was? He was the consummate politician. Now, I'm not going to ask if there's any politics or politicians in the church. But you know, politicians, they'll say what they need to say at times. They have handlers. I never could figure out what those handlers would do. Well, you need to say this in order to win votes. You got to say this in order to get this segment in your corner. And King Herod, when you go back and study his life, he would, when he was in Rome, he did as the Romans. When he was with the Jews, he did as the Jews. He wanted to hold on to his popularity. And any way that he could, he would, whatever he had to do, he would do it. His ego was out of check. Boy, people in church get their egos out of check every now and then. He was the wicked king. And so what, what did he do? Look at the ploys of the king. So here's what he did. He says in Acts chapter 12 that he decided that he was going to take James, the brother of John, and he killed him, just took him out. And he saw the popularity that it brought him, persecuting that way, putting the pressure upon him, taking James out. And everybody was back there going, way to go, Herod, you're great. So he sat there and he thought, man, that was so good. That went over so well. So what he decided to do then was that he was going to take Peter. And he was going to throw Peter into prison. And he was then going to have a kangaroo court and convict him. And for sure, if the murder of James was an approval rating high, when he did that to Peter, they would really love him. And so he acted. He killed James. He arrested Peter. And these two actions literally decimated the church. Now listen, the focus of the church was always in God's plan. It was now shifting from Jerusalem, and it's going to Antioch. Now you got to understand Antioch. Boy, that, that's a great place. Antioch's where the pagans gave us the nickname Christian. And so here it was that he traumatized the church, and as you would expect, they felt so powerless. Think about the mayor of LJ coming down on y'all. Think about them taking Dan and hanging him, effigy in, in the town square. Now, some of y'all may pray for that, but it's not going to happen, okay? And then they go down and get the pastor at First Baptist, LJ, whoever that is now, and they take him, and they're going to throw him in prison. And so here it was, the church was feeling so powerless. Here is Satan personified. Herod was determined to cut the heart out of Christianity by going after their leaders. And the church was really. You know, ha have you ever been to the point of being despondent? I've never been depressed. I've been low, but I've never been depressed. 
And I, if some of you suffer from depression, I would never try to tell you I know how you feel. Well, I, t- I see Christians do that all the time. Well, I, I know how you feel. Have you ever been depressed? No, then you don't know how to feel. And so, you know, have you ever been depressed? Have you ever been despondent? Have you ever been down? Have you ever had circumstances in your life that would change the way you feel? I have. I mean, listen, the other day, I was talking to a, a sweet lady who was going through all kinds of suffering. She said, Pastor, you just don't know how I feel. My husband died six, six years ago, seven years ago. And I sat there and I looked like, oh, I know how you feel. My first wife died of a malignant brain tumor when not, she was 27 and I was 30. I know exactly how you feel. My dad died 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And I'll never forget my mom, preacher wife mom, who stood in my house in the depths of her pain and said, you don't know how I feel. And as soon as she got that out of her mouth, she looked at me and said, you do know how I feel. Have you ever had those moments, those bad circumstances in your life, that they're there and it just carries you to a moment of despondency? The early church understood that. Here it was that, that, Philip, uh, that James was dead and now Peter was in prison and, and Herod was coming after them and they didn't know what to do. But then the scripture says in chapter 12, I like verse 5. In verse 5, all right, now listen, they they take Peter, they throw him in prison, and they they have four squads of soldiers around him, guards around him. Uh, Two are, are, are tied to him through chains. He was sleeping between them. And they had squads throughout the prison. And the Bible says in verse 5, that they were going to bring him in verse 4 and then bring him before the people after the Passover. Verse 5 says, and Peter was therefore kept in prison, and then God's big word. But when I was a youth pastor, one of my kids' father gave me a book, God's Big Little Words. We just read them and overlook them. Scripture says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but, can y'all say but with me? Ready? But, okay, this is what it says. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. I'm going to tell you, part of the problem in America today is prayerless churches and prayerless Christians. All we talk about is I don't know if y'all's church still has prayer meetings. I don't know. But you know, boy, that's a misnomer. I grew up in church. No, it's another night for the pastor to do a Bible study. But we call it prayer meeting. You know, they saw the persecution. And they saw Peter in prison. And the church went back to John Mark's mother's home and they began to pray. There was something inside of them that says, we need to see the mighty hand of God. And so, in their moment of desperation and despondency, Prayer became the priority. They hit their knees in prayer. One theologian said their apparent weakness was underlined by the fact that all they could do was pray. Have you ever needed to pray and you didn't know what to pray? You've been there, your kid disappointed. They were raised in church. Somewhere along the lines, they got strung out on drugs. Somewhere along the line, they got the girlfriend pregnant. Somewhere along life, they became an alcoholic. Somewhere along life's journey, they divorced their wife and left their kids. Somewhere along life's journey, they ended up in prison. And you come to church and you carry this burden. You carry this hurt. 
and you know you need to talk to God, but you just don't know what to say to him. Y'all been there? A grandfather walks down the hallway at his house, his little granddaughter was spending the night. He had told her to go to bed about 30 minutes early, and she was in there, and when he walked past her bedroom, he heard her singing the song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. And he stood there and he listened as she sang the alphabet song. It piqued his curiosity. He waited she got through and walked in and said, Honey, what are you doing? She said, I'm praying, Pop. What do you mean you're praying? So you're singing the alphabet song. She said, Pop, I don't know what to say, and so I'm just saying all the letters and let God put all the, the words together. Can I tell you something? I've been there. I didn't know what to say to him. I was hurting. And all I could do is get in the posture of prayer and, and let the Holy Spirit work. You know, you know what they say? When you can't put your prayer into words, God hears your heart. And there's times that I didn't know what to say. I just had to allow God to, to take my heart. He knew what I needed before I knew what I needed. They were praying for only what God could do for them. And the king probably thought, what are these idiots or fools doing? I've acted. I won the popularity vote when I killed James and Peter's in prison. I've acted once. I'm getting ready to act again as soon as the sun rises. And the skeptics, they don't ever understand the power of prayer. That unbeliever in your house, when you sit there and say, let's pray about it, if they're non-believers or skeptics, they don't understand the power of prayer. <laughs> that person you work next to, and they're going through all kinds of things in their life, and you say, well, let's pray about it. They look at you and sneer because they do not understand the power of prayer. I'm going to state the obvious. There's a lot of believers in churches don't understand the power of prayer. And so here was King Herod. Somewhere he had a spy out there. And maybe they were walking down the street by John Mark's mother's home and they, they heard him in there praying, Oh, Lord, would you please protect Peter? Lord, would you somehow just watch over him? And they were praying. The Bible says they were praying fervently. They were intense about what they were asking. Just as intense as Herod stretched forth his hand to harass the church from their knees, they were that intense about praying for the mighty hand of God. And you know what the Scripture says? Scripture tells us fervent prayer was made constantly by the church. Persecution always brings fear. Second thing I want you to understand tonight is that but prayer births faith. When you can learn that the most important thing you can ever do is pray. You see, from the Kneeling Christian Periodical, it states, prayer is our highest privilege, our gravest responsibility, our greatest power. And a church and a Christian that knows how to pray, they move heaven. So the saints discovered their strength. It was God. Get this scene in your mind. Listen, I read the Bible differently. I get that. So here it was, Peter in the depths of the prison. I watched a deputy sheriff walk by a moment ago. He's looking for some of y'all. I pay attention to what's going on in church. <laughs> he looked in here a couple of times. I think he spied, I think he spied right over here, right there on the back row. Sir, he's back there on the back row. But anyway, so they had these guards in this jail. 
I've been there. I've been to that jail. And so Peter was chained to these two guards. And you know, I love the way the Bible just says, Peter was sleeping. I wouldn't be sleeping. I'd, I'd be trying to get that, that paper clip out of my robe, you know, that could unlock those chains. I'd be trying to slide my hand. You know, I'd be like that old guy on, the, on America Has Talent. Man, I, I'd be trying to pull my, I'd be Houdini. Not Peter. He was just sleeping. I'm going to tell you something. There's something about that Christian who's in the midst of bad circumstances. He just sleeps. Something about that, that believer <laughs> that everything has come down upon him. And he just sleeps. Peter, the Bible says, was sleeping. The Bible says it was the night before Herod was going to bring Peter forth and yet and execute him in verse 6 and says Peter slept on. How did he do that? He didn't have a martyr complex. Instead, he had a faith in the mighty God. And he believed that God, whatever he needed escape from, God would make sure it happened. Peter was surrounded by a squad of four soldiers each. They were there to keep watch over him at, during the night. And everybody on their knees back at Mary's house, they were praying, God, would you, would you do something? It's like, it's like that Baptist church. God, would you do something? The whole time they got their fingers crossed hoping that God would do something. Maybe there was one or two like that in that prayer meeting. But for the church, they had seen the mighty hand of God. Lord, would you do something? There was one or two that would probably think, that boy, poor Peter, he sent it off. Verse 11, and when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. When you genuinely pray, heaven moves. Well, here comes the angel. And the Bible tells me that the angel walks in and just nudges Peter. Get up, get up. And Simon Peter probably aroused from that sleep the angel said, put on your sandals. I believe the chains had already fallen off. How in the world? And then he says, now put on your, 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 your cloak and go with me now. Come on, come on, Peter. And they walked out. They went through one squad of soldiers, two squads of soldiers. But there's a verse in this text that says, and when they got to the iron gate, the main gate, God opened it. It just opened on its own. And Peter is standing out there on that dusty street, and he's rubbing his wrists where the chains were and his ankles, and he was looking around. And the Scripture says that even Peter thought that maybe he was seeing another vision. And then when he realized, no, God had delivered him, he went to the house where they were praying. Here's what I want you to get. Those Christians in their prayers possess greater power than Herod's army. I don't care who your devil is. I want you to know in your prayer life, you possess all the power of heaven. And you ought to live like it. And so God, is our strength in this life. No matter how grim life might be, God and his angels are present and ministering. No matter what we're faced with, God can deliver us. No matter what you're going through, God can see you through. I wish God would open up for your now, right now, your eyes so that you could see the angels in this room. Boy, y'all got quiet on that. Are you a charismatic, Frank? Yep, in the purest sense I am. I'm gifted by the Spirit of God. Now, I don't speak in tongues. I don't slay people in spirit. But I'll tell you what, I do believe in ministering angels. When my wife was dying,
Dan, am I doing okay thus far? Am I doing okay on time? I, I don't want to keep y'all. This is a three-hour sermon. I don't want to keep it too long. When my first wife was dying, she was 20, 20, she was 24, 25 when we found the brain tumor. She died at 27. My church was on me. And the reason they were on me, the, the one I'm still at, the reason they were on me because our church was growing. God was getting loose in the church. I'll never forget that little old lady came up to me. She, she, did, she, she had lipstick with lips. We're not there anymore. And she, she walked up to me and she said, if you keep preaching on the spirit of God, things are going to get out of hand around here. I looked at her and said, oh, no, ma'am, they won't, they won't. She said, oh, you don't, the spirit of God's going to get loose around here. If you, you keep preaching on the spirit of God, it's going to get out of hand. I said, no, ma'am, no, 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 it won't. She said, how do you know that? I said, because you won't let it. <laughs> you know, every church has got cold water to keep the committee. Let the flame of God get loose in the church, and they'll take water and pour on it, snuff it out. So they were on me. They didn't want the church growing. They liked their 100 people. And Gwinnett County was just booming. And every Sunday we were seeing people joining, people sitting in their seats. They didn't like that. They didn't like that at all. And so when Debbie was going through her sickness, I had to be suspect of everything. I never forget this guy comes in the outer office. I need to see the pastor of this church. And I got up from my desk and I walked out of there and there was the wildest looking guy I've ever seen in my life. White guy, afro out to here, thick glasses, torn jeans. This was before you paid 200 bucks for him. Torn jeans. He looked at me and said, you the pastor of this church? I said, yes, sir. God told me to come see you. And he had a man with him who was blind. And I said, well, come on back. I thought, this will be interesting. But you know what? I thought, somebody's trying to catch me here. So we get back there, and he looks at me, and he says, Pastor, said, you got some needs in your life right now. I said, yeah, I do. He said, your wife is pretty sick. I said, yes, she is. I said, how do you know? He said, I was at a prayer meeting this morning. We were praying, and the Lord told me to come talk to you about that. I always get leery of anybody saying, well, the Lord told me to tell you. No, your wife told you to tell me. I mean, you know, and so, so he said, he said, the Lord told me to come talk to you. He said, now I know why he told me to bring what he told me to bring. And Dan, I, I said, I'm telling you the gospel truth. He gives up and says, can I go get it? I said, sure. He goes out to his car. I'm looking at the blind guy who's just kind of, you know, he can not see anything going on in my office. And, and I said, what, what's going on? He said, we were at a prayer meeting, and they just mentioned your name. And he got me and said, Lord, tell me to go talk to that pastor. He comes in with a bag. And the bag was rattled. I thought, oh, gosh, we're going to handle snakes. <laughs> and, and so he says, your wife is dying and your church is fighting. And it was. And the Lord told me to feed you. And he reached in that bag and pulled out a loaf of French bread. Reached back in and got Welch's grape juice. And he broke the bread and right there at my de desk, we had the Lord's Supper. He said, you mind if I pray for you? By that time, my heart was surrendered. And I said, whatever. And he came around the back of my desk, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he started praying, Lord, this man's wife needs healing. And then he said, Lord, this church needs healing. And he started praying, and then he stopped. And I thought, oh, here we go. We're going, he's going to start speaking in tongues. Baptist. And he stopped and he said, 
your wife's going to be fine. Your church is going to be united. Your church is going to become one of the great churches in this area. She went back to praying. She got through, slapped me on the back, put the top on the grape juice, put it back in the bag, threw the bread back in the bag, grabbed the blind guy, took off. I've never seen him since. I do believe, do believe in ministering angels. I do believe in divine messengers. And here this angel came. And this angel, because of the faith, their prayer life birthed that prayer. God proved he can deliver you out of your circumstances, whatever they are, if you'll trust him. Last thing I want to tell you is this, power that brings fortitude is found in prayer. Power is found in our faith. The God of Simon Peter still lives. They got there and Peter goes to that house. He's knocking on the door and Rhoda, the Bible says Rhoda got up and she heard the sound and she walked out there and, and she looked and, and she, she thought she was hallucinating. She turns around and goes back, I, I don't know, who, I, it looks like Peter, but you know, he's in jail. You know, da, 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 da. And they all, Peter walks in. The miracle. Their prayer lives ushered in, in the midst of persecution, great faith, great power. As they prayed, God began to move. What is it your church is struggling with? What is it in your family life that you need the mighty hand of God to show up? 1964, there was a communist Simba rebels that took over a city in Zaire. And so they began to go around, much like they're doing in Afghanistan right now. And they're trying to find where in our day, they're trying to find those who helped Americans, the interpreters, and they're hanging them. My son has worked for a solid week trying to get his two interpreters out of Afghanistan. And so in that day, in 1964, anybody that resisted the communist takeover, they would kill, they would arrest. And so they went around, and the ones they didn't kill, they arrested, and they brought them and threw them in prison. There was a pastor by the name of Idu. And Pastor Idu was one that was arrested. And so they took him and they threw him in prison. And the word was that the next day was the birth date of the founder of the revolution. So they were going to take these prisoners down to the main square of town and they were going to execute them by gunfire. So the next day they get up and they go into the prison. They empty the prison and made them all come outside and stand. And then they begin to load them up on these buses. And they were going to carry them down to the town square. And the buses or the trucks would not start. So they got the prisoners off and they lined them up this long line and they said, count off one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And so they did it all the way down the line and then they put all the ones back on the trucks and they took all the twos back into the prison. The trucks still wouldn't start. So they took all the ones off the trucks and made them run double time downtown to the square. Pastor I do was a two. So when they went back into that prison, he just began to go to prisoner after prisoner after prisoner. Talk to them about death and heaven and were they ready. And when he witnessed to the last prisoner, number twos, in the prison, they heard the gunshot from the square. A few minutes later, an official comes in 
and rattle off a bunch of words that amounted to this. Pastor, I do. Pastor, I do. Pastor, I do. Where are you? He just knew his time had come. And when he identified himself, they said, there's been a mistake. You have been imprisoned wrongly. They took him out, and they set him free. When he got back to his home, next to the chapel where he pastored, he heard the moans and groans of his parishioners on their face before God. They had just read about Simon Peter being set free. And as they were praying, Pastor I do walks in the door. Somebody in that church is just like somebody in your church. Every time your pastor says, every head bowed, every eye closed, there's always one that's looking around. And that day as they were all praying, there was probably one that was looking around. So Pastor I do come in. And she cried out, Pastor I do. Pastor I do. And they all turned around and saw their pastor standing there. And they said, the God of Simon Peter still lives. And I'm telling you tonight, this is why God brought me here. To tell you no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what you're faced with in your life, the God of Simon Peter still lives. And that you and I need to live like it. So here's the invitation. It's going to be real simple. Mr. Music Man, it's going to be simple. Is that your pianist sitting over there? It's going to be real simple. Okay? You can lead us in whatever you want to lead us in. Okay? Pastor, I want you to come and stand. And folks, listen, some of you need to get saved tonight. You just need to get saved. You just need Jesus. And all you got to do is just say, Lord Jesus, would you come in my life and change me? You must repent of your sin and receive Christ. There's nothing more scary to me than to live a lifetime and in church and go straight to hell from the fourth or fifth row back. That would frighten me to death. So you need to be saved. Pastor's going to be standing here. Some of you may not be members of this church. You need to join this church. you got a great pastor. Great pastor. Been here 10 years, eight and a half. Man, you're going to be 150 when you've been there 41 years like me. <laughs> but here's the invitation. Some of you need to join. Hey, join. God never asked Christians to live isolated. He expects you to serve through his church. If your church is like my church, you don't join, you don't serve. You have to be a member to serve. Now, we'll let you greet, but I'm not going to let you take up the offering. Mm. I'm not going to let you teach a Sunday school class. You've got to be a member to serve. Now, for the rest of you, who thought I'd just let you off the hook, here it is. If you're like me in my church, on Sundays I look around that auditorium there's a lot of folks who had not darkened the altar of God in a long time and you know what's sad to me they're suffering they got problems they got bad circumstances companies going under can't get people to work <laughs> I look up and see a man whose wife walked off and left him. Hadn't been at altar God probably in 30, 40 years. Here's the invitation. What one thing is plaguing your life? What is that one thing that keeps you staring at the still at the ceiling at night? Just close.
just gone, does it? What is it that you would say, Lord, this could just be handled? Here's what I'm asking. While he's up here singing, she's playing. I want you to bring that one thing. I want you to kneel around this altar. These are not steps. This is the altar of God. I want you to kneel around this altar. If you can't kneel, come stand. If you can't stand long, sit on the front row. But I want you to come and say, God, this one thing. Set me free. Every one of you got one thing. This boy had one thing. So how bad do you want to be set free? How many of those shackles do you want loosened to fall off? Or maybe you just like cuddling that one thing. Because as you cuddle it, you never have victory. Some of you may be scared of victory. Trust me, the mighty hand of God is ready to come upon your life. So God, you take every letter of our alphabet and you form the word the words of our prayer and God right now whatever that one burden is that one thing help us to understand that the God of Simon Peter still lives and let us bring it to your feet and leave it there. Do your work in our lives in a tremendous way. In Jesus' powerful name, I pray. Amen. The stand, they're going to start Walkers wide open. You bring that one thing. Just bring it. Just bring it. Let Jesus have it.
wretched, blind, sight riches healing of the mind. All I need in Thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as